Hello and welcome to um, this forum and conversation about ancient Christians, an introduction for Latter-day Saints. How many of you brought your books with you? Anybody? It's, it's kind of heavy to carry around, to be honest, yeah. Um, my name is Rosalind Welch. I am the Associate Director at the Maxwell Institute, um, under whose imprint um, this book was published. We are delighted to have the editors of the volume with us today. We're grateful that you're here, um, and we're proud to celebrate one of the Maxwell Institute's um, signature products for this year. We'll um, begin with prayer, and I've asked Jennifer Delaney if she would pray for us. Our Father in Heaven, we're so grateful to be together. We're grateful for this wonderful occasion. We're grateful for all of the scholars who work to bring this volume together. We're grateful for the editors. We're grateful for the resources that were available to make such a beautiful production possible. We are grateful for the, the consecrated study to share what each of the, uh, the authors have learned with a larger audience to help uh, deepen our appreciation for our early Christian brothers and sisters. We're grateful for a chance to celebrate that this day. Pray for thy spirit to be with all those who will be speaking. Help us to enjoy this wonderful accomplishment and to, to deepen our appreciation of the, the legacy of faith that is ours. And we say these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. So uh, sitting behind me, you see the four editors of the volume, uh, Jason Combs, uh, Christian Heal, Catherine Jones Taylor, and Mark Ellison. Um, each one of them brings their scholarly expertise to this book. Dr. Combs um, in History of Early Christianity, uh, Dr. Heal in um, Syriac Christianity and um, Syriac texts, Dr. Um, Taylor in Art History and Late Antique Christian Art, and Dr. Ellison um, in Early Iconography of Christian Art and Social Practices of Early Christians. More than their scholarly expertise, though, um, these editors and authors brought their curiosity and their compassion to this project, seeking to understand early Christians as generously as possible and to transmit the story of our religious tradition's roots um, in as respectful and expansive a way as possible. Um, the Maxwell Institute has a mission to inspire and fortify Latter-day Saints in their faith so we, and by we I mean they, they knew that this wouldn't be a conventional academic book. That we wanted to reach readers' hearts as well as their minds. Or we wanted to reach their hearts by way of their minds. Um, and to create a feeling of kinship and gratitude across the ages between saints of the latter days and saints of the early days. One of the ways that they achieve this is through the generous use of art and image, which graces almost every page of this book, and partly why it is so heavy to carry around, um, but it brings, really brings the book alive. As a non-historian myself, I'm a scholar of, of literature and theology, um, the ways and methods of historians are sometimes mysterious to me, but I never fail to be thrilled and to be moved when a historian manages to make me care about human experience that is utterly different from my own across distances of time and space, and yet somehow that calls to me and that seeks my human witness from across that distance. I think our editors have accomplished that in this volume. I'm grateful to them for it. Um, we will structure our, our time together today as a conversation as much as we can. Um, we'll start with short remarks by Dr. Combs, who will kind of orient us to the book, um, to its aims and to its scope. Um, then we'll devote most of our time to questions from you, so please be thinking um, about what you would like to know. Um, I will moderate those questions and we'll call on you just by the raise of hands. I'll be sitting over here and I won't have a view of this part of the balcony, so you over here have an assignment. If somebody up there is raising their hands, you have to alert me to it, okay? So I can call on anybody up there, but um, we'd like to hear from as many as you, of you as you can, and if you'd um, direct your, your question to all or to one of our editors up here. Editors, we talked about how best to make you visible and audible for our audience here and the camera, 
So if you wouldn't mind, you don't have to come to the podium, but if you would stand when a question is directed to you. Um, we'll wrap up the Q&A at about 2.45, and then we've invited Dr. Miranda Wilcox, who wrote the a beautiful um, conclusion to the volume, to offer us some concluding remarks today. Um, after that, we will wrap up here, and you are all invited to join us at a reception at um, the Maxwell Institute, which is just right up the street if you haven't visited us there in the Westview building yet um, at 3 o'clock. You are all welcome. Um, on your way out, you can stop by our table. This is sort of a new thing. There's Maxwell Institute swag. Did you know that? There's, <laughs> we have stickers, we have pins, we have all sorts of beautifully branded because they reflect um, the imagery and iconography of the book, right? Um, items that you can pick up there. There's also a QR code that you can scan with your phone to purchase the volume if you haven't had a chance to do that as well. Um, I want to thank our administrative staff, Ashley and Jeremy and Tessa, who's probably busy over at the, at the Institute right now for all their work um, putting together this event today, and mostly um, our editors and our contributors. Um, they, I see many of them among us today. So with that, we will turn the time over to you. So I want to start today with a story. Uh, I set to work on my family history soon after I joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. As the, first con as the first convert to the church in my direct patrilineal line, I was interested to learn that a great-great-uncle had likewise joined the church, but for that choice had been kicked out of the family and mostly forgotten. Now, generations later, I was engaged in a work to reunite our family, to ritually mend broken relationships, to reclaim what was lost. It may seem a very Latter-day Saint thing to begin with a story about family history, and rightfully so. One of the grand purposes of the Restoration is our work to bind together dispensations and peoples. When speaking about baptism for the dead, the prophet Joseph Smith used the language of creating a welding link of some kind between fathers and children. Joseph spoke of this as the fulfillment of the prophecy of Malachi, that Elijah would be sent to turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of children to their fathers. The ongoing restoration, I believe, is ongoing in part because there is so much healing left to do in the world so many relationships that need to be restored. Our book, Ancient Christians, an introduction for Latter-day Saints, participates in this work of restoration by reclaiming what has been lost to us, by reestablishing relationships, by turning our hearts to some of our spiritual mothers and fathers that we have forgotten or neglected. What would it look like if Latter-day Saints embraced ancient Christians as our own. I'm not suggesting that we uncritically accept everything that ancient Christians taught or practiced, nothing that would dilute our doctrine as Latter-day Saints or deter the unique purposes to which God has called us in these latter days. Rather, I'm imagining something akin to what Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf called being light gatherers, or what President Brigham Young envisioned when he talked about us being gatherers of truth. It is our duty and calling as ministers of the same salvation and gospel to gather every item of truth and reject every error, President Young once taught. He spoke of gathering up all the truths in the world pertaining to life and salvation, even to the gospel we preach. And where did President Young expect us to find these truths about our gospel? with professed infidels, or with the Universalists, or the Church of Rome, or the Methodists, the Church of England, the Presbyterians, the Baptists, the Quakers, the Shakers, or any of the other various and numerous different sects and parties, all of whom have more or less truth. I would add to Brigham Young's list the various ancient Christians we include in our book. So what would it look like to see ancient Christians as our spiritual ancestors? to gather up their experiences, their stories, as we regularly do with our own personal family histories. What would this look like? I think I have a, 
think I have a pretty good idea. It would look like Christian Heal celebrating ancient sermons and joining with a Christian woman named Agaria on a pilgrimage through ancient Christian preaching. It would look like Tom Waymond and Ariel Bybee Lawton carefully tracing the developments of ancient Christian systems of power and authority, providing us with both cautions and hope as they explore the origins of canon and creeds or priesthood offices and women's leadership roles. It would look like Matt Gray and Mark Ellison inviting us to imagine and enter into ancient Christians' most sacred spaces and practices of worship, celebrating our shared desire to connect with God and with our fellow saints. It would look like Gay Strather, Cecilia Peake, and me pondering with our ancient Christian ancestors about God's great purposes for humankind, gaining new insights into scripture's teachings about how we are created in the image of God, how we might understand the Godhead, and the grace of Jesus' work to illuminate, redeem, and rescue us. It would look like Daniel Becerra finding fellowships with those ancient Christians who understood life as an opportunity to grow into the likeness of God through the grace of Jesus Christ and our own moral formation. It would look like Catherine Taylor beckoning us to the cemeteries and shrines of these early day saints and ancient martyrs to learn how we might better incline our hearts toward our deceased loved ones. It would look like Jill Kirby and Nick Frederick seeing a reflection of ourselves in ancient Christians' hope for the resurrection and their desire to know more about what will transpire in the afterlife or when Christ comes again. And in the end, we would be reminded by Miranda Wilcox that these lives of service, <laughs> sacrifice, and devotion to our God in Christ were not relegated solely to the earliest centuries of Christian history, but that we might find kindred saints among medieval Christians as well. And on top of all this, such a work would necessarily be full of images of art, artifacts, and architecture that would elevate the words on the page in such a way that we might see what they saw and maybe experience a little of what they felt. What would it look like if Latter-day Saints embraced ancient Christians as our own? If we were to engage in this one key aspect of the ongoing restoration, to turn our hearts to our fathers and mothers, I think it would look something like this book. Ancient Christians, an introduction for Latter-day Saints. Thank you. Before we move into the question and answer phase, I, I, I'd like to just take a minute to thank everybody who's been involved in this project. We brought this project to the Neil A. Maxwell Institute because we believe in its mission to gather and nurture disciple scholars whose work inspires and fortifies Latter-day Saints in their testimonies of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and engages the world of religious ideas. We are so grateful to Spencer Blumen, director of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute, and to its governing board for believing in this project and for seeing the potential, for seeing its potential to become, as Blumen has called it, a path-breaking work on ancient Christianity. We are grateful to all of our authors for consecrating their specializations and expertise for such a book. I'm not sure that our church has ever had so many specialists trained in the historical study of the New Testament and ancient Christianity as we have today in this moment. I must mention in particular Mark Ellison and Catherine Taylor, who dedicated endless hours to curating the stunning exhibit of artwork found in this book encompassing centuries of Christian devotion. And then Andrew Heiss, who brought it all together with his engaging design and careful attention to our texts and images. We're also thankful to the numerous BYU student workers and Maxwell Institute staff who, who invested so much of their time and talents into this book. And we are so grateful to, and we are also very grateful to Rosalind Welch and to all of you for joining us this afternoon in celebration of this work. Uh, this work for all of us has truly been a labor of love. Thank you so much for being here to celebrate this with us.
um, just by directing a, a question myself to each one of our panelists, and, and they're not my questions, actually they're questions submitted by our wonderful um, student employees and research assistants at the, at the Institute. But use this time, please, wisely to be thinking of your own questions, and so um, we'll, we'll open it up in just a moment. Um, Jason, thank you um, for that. Um, Christian, I wondered if you would address um, a question that's probably on um, a lot of people's minds. And um, what does, and that is, what does this project say about the need for a restoration, right? How does, how does this work and the, the, the work of the, uh, understanding what the, the early day saints um, reflect on why we needed a restoration in the 19th century through this stuff? Thanks. I was hoping to get away with not speaking with three <laughs> other brilliant people. <laughs> Here we are. Um, we'll attempt to, an answer of this. It's a great question, actually, because we can think when we start to celebrate the uh, wonderful insights and beautiful ideas and beautiful art of a particular group of Christians, that this somehow undermines our project as Latter-day Saints to restore truth. But what I think it does for me, actually, is show why our importance is so, why our project is so vital. Because if we can find beauty and truth in this one area of the human family's desires to worship God, what can we find elsewhere? And in, in my view, I think, and, and wonderfully articulated by Brigham Young, as, as Jason has shown, the project of the restoration is to gather all truth wherever we find it. We've gone to a portion of the world's history that we know about, that we love about, that we care about, and gather that into the saints. And our work is an invitation to others involved in this grand restoration project to do the same in, for their areas of expertise. Bring the, be the beauties and truth from Judaism, from medieval Christianity, from Islam, from Buddhism, from those who have sought to enlighten the world, to seek God, to worship, to feel God's presence in their heart, and this is, these are treasures that is lying around in history, around the world and in cultures, both in the present day and in history. And so I think it's, a, for me, a spur to the Restoration Project, that there's so much good that we can claim as Latter-day Saints and as part of this Grand Restoration Project. Catherine, for you, um, the book is full of gorgeous art and architecture, as you've mentioned a couple of times. Um, what for you is a meaningful image or a special image that you'd like to direct our attention to in the book, um, and, and, and why? I thought this was a good one for you. Oh, <laughs> wow. There, there are so many um, beautiful, and not just beautiful aesthetically uh, images, but images that have layers to them that are meaning symbolically and within their own context. And I, I do have to just give one more shout out to my colleague, Mark Ellison, um, who sat with me for weeks and weeks and weeks um, as we curated and truly kind of fit these works together into the book. Um, I was thinking this morning about the art that was in my, that's in my chapter in particular. And um, I want to talk about two. Um, one is a small, uh, it's a very small ivory casket that likely a relic or um, something that they call a eulogia, a, a, a souvenir from a holy place was kept in. And on the front of this ivory casket is an image of the earliest uh, kind of baldacchino, the kind of um, the space that was over the top of the grave of Peter. And as you may know, Peter's grave was the second most important one in all of early Christendom. Of course, first being the church of the early, of the, uh, of the sepulcher. And, um, and in this image, there are two little people that you have to look really carefully to see, that they're taking a cloth and they're hanging it over the tomb. And while we you know, don't really practice cult of the saints activity in so many ways, 
um, it really touches me that they wanted some contact with the earliest saints and the uh, and Peter and other apostles and early martyrs because they wanted that connection of holiness to Jesus. That's where they were pointing and what they were looking at. And, and I think that we reach out in so many ways ourselves to, to make that contact, physical or metaphysical, um, spiritual contact with the Lord because we look to him for our hope in resurrection and reconciliation and many, many other things. And the other, um, the other work of art I was thinking about um, this morning is a sarcophagus that is in a place where I work um, uh, in the south of France, where early Gallic uh, Christians gather in number. And in the center of that sarcophagus, this large stone coffin, is Christ with this scroll that he rolls out. And the scroll, he's not reading the scroll. The scroll is for us to see. It's a giving of the law, but it's also um, an, a symbol of himself as the lawgiver. And he's standing on a, on a mount with the four rivers of paradise flowing out from it. And this is, this is truly an apocalyptic Christ. Um, and, and behind him are these two pillars, and they're the only two pillars on this pillared sarcophagus, on this coffin that an early Christian chose to commission and purchase for their earthly resting place. And these two pillars have vines, living vines. And I love this image because it recollects in so many ways our hope and our forward-looking um, anticipation of, of the great day of the coming of the Lord. And this connects me, and I hope that these images can connect you as well, in so many ways, to, to the lively, hopeful belief in, uh, salvific, uh, in the salvific uh, mission and the accomplishment of of those things in, in and through Jesus Christ. Um, for me, art is in so many ways theology. We, we come to God and we speak about God, not just in text and language, but I think there's something very, um, very alive and visually stirring and aesthetically uh, moving about seeing having representations of faith over, over the centuries. And, and I find the early Christians to be particularly compelling. This was a new world. This was a new language. They are, they are adapting and adopting things that they knew, that they are creating a new, kind of, uh, a new kind of visual language. So I'm sorry that was two instead of one. <laughs> All right, um, Mark, for you, Jason spoke a little bit about um, how and why, as Latter-day Saints, we feel connected to early day saints and why that's a kind of intrinsic part of um, Joseph Smith's restoration. But this student sort of wanted to talk more personally and ask more personally, um, why do you think it's important to you in your life to, to have that connection with our kind of spiritual forebears? And over the course of doing this project, or if you'd like to, you can expand it more broadly over the course of your career, um, how has your relationship to those ancient saints changed? Hmm. Okay. Um, well, first, uh, let me echo what uh, my co-editors have said. This was a joy to work together on this project, and uh, I, I, I'm just so grateful uh, to Jason for his leadership, to my co-editors, uh, the, the friendship and the collegiality we've shared, and then to all the contributors. Uh, I just love this. This has been a real highlight of my career. And working with Catherine on early Christian images and art, uh, we both share a love of that, and that was just really a joy, even though it was a lot of very intense uh, work in the final weeks of the publication. Um, to this question about um, 
how my own view of early Christians have, has changed and, uh, and, and why it's important for us to recover them um, for me as a Latter-day Saint. Um, I, I became fascinated with the New Testament and the world of early Christianity um, when I was in high school. I went to a Catholic high school and, um, and that just uh, brought me into contact with other branches of Christianity and a whole rich, deep tradition that I, I hadn't been aware of. Um, and I realized that some of the things that I had been taught or told and had maybe uncritically absorbed uh, were overly narrow or um, maybe not the most charitable views of the whole religious world. And I encountered people who had a deep love of Christ. I wanted to understand them better. I, um, I, I also, though, um, as I, I became interested in the New Testament and what came after the New Testament, my initial motivations were uh, to find evidence and proof for Latter-day Saint distinctives and to find evidence of a, a great falling away, a great apostasy, everything that went wrong in the past. Well, we can do that, um, and, and it, it's not difficult to find. We can do that with ourselves. We can do that in the relationships that we have with people we love. I don't know if that's the most productive or charitable way to live, uh, to always look for what's wrong. Um, I came uh, in, in the very first class I took on reading early Christians, I came to realize that there are maybe some more Christ-like and expansive and productive ways to read this literature. I found things that were beautiful and inspiring. I found that some of these people spoke uh, in ways that I, I not only recognized a brother or sister in Christ, but I realized I, I was feeling envy for the degree of faith and the degree of beauty that they had in, in their articulation of faith. And, uh, and it was moving me to be a better Latter-day Saint, uh, just learning about the ancient saints. Um, to give just one little example, something I shared in my chapter. Um, my own experience of uh, going to church every Sunday and partaking of the sacrament, this is the ordinance that comes to us most frequently as Latter-day Saints. Um, many times um, I have come to that meeting just hungering, thirsting, wanting renewal, feeling my own lack, feeling the need for God's help in my life. and. Uh, as I was studying ancient Christians, I realized these people were thinking deeply about their own experience of what we would call sacrament meeting. They called Eucharist or the Mass, communion. Uh, and they were thinking about it in connection with Jesus and the Last Supper, Jesus' feeding miracles during his life. They, they were thinking about this ritually and deeply. One early Christian tradition that's really beautiful that, that we see in Byzantine and Syriac Christianity is that over the first few centuries, um, Christians came to think of that experience in connection with Isaiah's vision in Isaiah chapter 6. You might remember Isaiah in Isaiah 6 sees the throne of God and he sees it surrounded by these winged angels, the seraphim, and he's overwhelmed by the sight and he says, woe is me, I am undone. He feels his unfitness, his unworthiness to be there, to be seeing this. And at that moment of despair, an angel flies to him taking a, a coal from the altar in the heavenly temple and he brings this coal to Isaiah and he touches it to Isaiah's lips and he says, this has touched your iniquity, your iniquity is purged, your sin is cleansed. And um, where Isaiah a few moments before had been feeling like, I can't be here, now he's transformed and he hears the voice of the Lord saying, who shall we send? And Isaiah says, I'll do it, send me. Here am I sending me. This is his call as a prophet. That changed the way I take the sacrament. That changed the way I go to sacrament. Sometimes when I'm feeling lost and that tray of bread is passed down the road to me, I think of the coal touching Isaiah's lips and transforming him, cleansing him, renewing him all over again. And I think of the Lord's words or the angel's words saying, uh, your iniquity is purged. Who shall I send? You know, these kinds of words. And I feel renewed in my heart to, to go forth from that meeting and bear my own witness to the world and try to live as a vehicle of God's grace and love through the world. Um, I love that 
my ancient Christian ancestors were thinking in such rich ways about their own worship experiences and ways that would reach down through the centuries and touch my heart in a simple Latter-day Saint sacrament meeting. And it's made me a better saint. So there's, the, there's an answer. <laughs> All right, we will open it up to um, questions from you now. Um, uh, raise your hand, I'll call on you, and we ask you to, to stand and speak clearly, so hopefully it will be audible on our recording as well. Yes. So this one's for Jason, but I guess it could go for any of you. Uh, Jason's wife is my manager, so. <laughs> but I guess I was thinking, and this, any of you can answer this, but what surprises did you find as you did this work? Obviously, you came to this work with a wealth of knowledge and experience in your field, um, which, by the way, I don't know exactly. She's talk, talked a little bit about your work, but um, even though you had all that preparation, what surprises did you find that, that kind of jumped out at you? Yeah, I, I can start. Uh, in the chapter I wrote on uh, the nature of God, I, I came to it with a lot of, uh, I think, what are traditional Latter-day Saint assumptions about what other Christians believe about things like the Trinity. And the more I read some of the ancient writings about it, the more I realized that I actually agreed with a lot more things than I thought I would. Right? Um, and I, I even found, found beauty in some of the ways that they reflected on, on the nature of God and tried to understand God, even in ways that, that I disagree with as a Latter-day Saint. For instance, um, uh, as a Latter-day Saint, I affirm that, that God the Father has a body, a tangible body. Uh, that is not common among most Christians and Christian denominations today. And that belief, uh, early Christians start talking about that belief very early on. Uh, but it was helpful to me to realize that one of the reasons they begin to talk about God the Father not having a body came out of the sincere desire to exalt God. Uh, it, it came from their desire to say, uh, God is so great, so far beyond what we can understand as mortal beings, and since I can understand what a body is, God must not have a body. And while I disagree with that opinion, as a Latter-day Saint, uh, I can still appreciate uh, the ways in which Christians learn to discuss and, 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 and study their scriptures and try and understand God in new ways. So that's, that's one of the ways that, that, uh, that I saw something and learned something new as I was working on my chapter. Anybody else on the chain? Very briefly, um, in, in thinking about uh, early Christian fathers in particular who are writing about um, resurrection and efficacious work for the dead, it, was, it surprised me when I started mapping um, where many of these theologians were either based or where they were trained, that there were a lot of Egyptian or Greek Egyptian um, uh, kind of intonations and trainings to their work. And, and it really, um, it made me very happy to see that this ages old fascination with the care of the dead in particular that spans throughout the Egyptian tradition was, was also in many ways translating into what would filter into regular, you know, um, early Christian discussion on that same topic. I think that that is a, a position and something I discovered that surprised me and that could be, I think, further elucidated. It was fascinating to me anyway, to see that kind of origin and that it had, um, that it's, it's likely very, very old, steeped in that kind of, you know, uh, that hope in uh, resurrection and, uh, and preparation of the dead. Yes, Ken. Um, it's, it seems to me that often when we address publications to Latter-day Saints about the ancient world, the ancient Christian world, it's usually geared through the canon, through the New Testament, because we read the New Testament every four years. Could you share maybe what the editorial conversations were like 
behind the scenes such that we have a volume here about ancient Christians, not about the text they produced? What was the conversation such that you got to the bodies behind the text when so many of our publications focus on the text? To pick up that I can I can, I can start. Um, uh, we we came we came to this book first with the idea that we wanted to talk about ancient Christians in the period after the New Testament, a period that for a lot of Latter Day Saints um, we are very unfamiliar with, uh, broadly speaking, right? Um, and we thought, you know what, that might fit nicely during a New Testament year, um, and. And this comes back to this, the, the, the question of what, what sort of things surprised me as I was studying. Uh, one of the things that surprised me was just how well it fit in a New Testament year. Um, in, in my chapter and in many of our chapters, um, as, as we are studying the words of ancient Christians in the second, third, and fourth century and beyond, um, what we are reading is their reflections on Scripture. Their reflections on the New Testament. Um, they they are so deeply immersed in the text and and are are and sometimes have 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 insights into the text that, that can help us as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints to gain new insights, as as Mark Ellison was suggesting a moment ago. Um, so that's I'll, I'll I'll leave it there. Any other any other thoughts on that? Yeah. Oh, just really quick. Uh, at, at one point uh, in our discussions, I, uh, I I think we were envisioning a book or a series of books uh, about um, early Christianity, and I if I remember right, uh, it was Jason Combs' idea to change the title to Ancient Christians, uh, focusing on people, which I think was a brilliant and inspired move because. It really is, the whole book is a, an effort to turn our hearts to people. And we, we learn about their religion and their faith and system uh, as we uh, study their lives, but we're really interested in, in the recovery of people, which is a very restoration project. I think quickly, focusing on the people rather than the, the, the sort of Christianity, I think makes, uh, it closes the gap between us and them in a really useful way. Uh, the recent Pew research um, suggests that members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints aren't the most loved people in <laughs> North America. But when you talk to Quinn Monson in, in um, political science, he says in that test data, they've discovered that when people know an individual Latter-day Saint, that relationship with the whole church, their perception of the whole church changes. I think this is part of this project. When you actually know ancient Christians, you can start to look on the whole. We, we then have to kind of reevaluate our assumptions about the whole uh, period and what it, what we mean by s some of the sort of ideas we've had about ancient Christianity. Yes, I think that's a kind of reminded of the presence of, well, in the art that I see and in the art that I study. By the way, I, I work in late ancient Christian iconography. I work in kind of the realm of the dead, so I spend a lot of times in catacombs and cemeteries and um, looking at artifacts that primarily survive because they are preserved specifically uh, in commemoration and memorial of people who are deceased. There's kind of a, a sacrosanct line in so many uh, ways to, to those uh, objects and those spaces. Um, uh, barring, of course, the gathering up of... Uh, anyway, we, we won't go into all of that. But, but um, one thing that I have been 
very deeply moved uh, by in, in my study of this period of art. And one of, one of the things that shows up is actually right here on the cover. Um, this mosaic that, that really, again, depicts, you know, kind of an apocalyptic scene. It's got the four um, beasts of the apocalypse also representing the evangelist. You've got that fiery sky. You have Christ dressed in gold as, a, as an emperor with those, those purple clavi uh, that uh, run down through his toga. And you have, you have different saints who, and apostles here who are gathered together. And you also have women who are holding wreaths, laurel wreaths over their heads. And for, for me, in so many ways, this is a gathering of, um, of the righteous. This is a gathering of all the world, actually. And, um, and I think about going out into the world and taking what we know and what we hold precious in our own rites and in our own rituals as a collective body. And, um, you know, I, I was at the temple uh, a couple of weeks ago, and even in my own kind of practice there, I, I notice um, symbolically represented exactly what's here. Um, I, see, I see the lily and the rose. I see the... Um, I see my brothers and sisters from all over the world. And, and, and I just think of the great project that, um, that the gathering is, that the restoration is, and, and that it was imagined in the past, and that it comes forward and has threads into, into our lives, um, even today as Latter-day Saints. Um, so yes, I love I love looking for the kind of deeper symbolism that I that I find there, and I also, you know, I I do look at a lot at women in early Christianity, and I would be remiss to, if I didn't say uh, that they had an impact, that they are they were active movers and shakers in so many ways. They championed the cause of Jesus. They supported it with their lives and their means. They protect it. And they, they were faithful. They had voices and they had lives and they had objects that they held um, to remind them of their faith and to represent their faith. And and so many of the things that we can learn through visual image, you know, these were things that, that were accessible to a wide range of people, not just those who could have access to a text or who could read. And, um, and so I think, I think about those women a lot. And, um, and they show up in the way that I remember my responsibility to as, um, as a faithful, active member of this church who cares deeply for its success. And um, yeah, I, I just, I hope that answered your question. Sorry to go off on a bit of a testimony there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Reed, we'll put the R. Well, Reed, I see a student up top who has a question. Is that okay? <laughs> up here, yes, please go ahead, yeah. Well, our typical idea of the, the apostasy often likes to use words like uh, perverted or took away, you know, great abominable church, things like that. I think this book goes a long way in helping us rethink the idea of early Christianity and rethinking our idea of the apostasy. But then the question arises, where did we get our traditional idea of the apostasy? Where did we adopt that from? And why, why did we adopt that idea? Why did we need that? Why did early LDS people want that? I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I, I discussed this a little bit in the introduction to the book. Um, uh, our, 
understanding of a great apostasy comes first and foremost from our scriptures. Uh, the Book of Mormon, Nephi has a vision where he sees uh, what he describes as a great and abominable church. Um, and, and through uh, Latter-day Saint prophets and apostles, that great and abominable church has been interpreted as broadly uh, as anything that, that impedes us from, that stops us from, from approaching God. I think the problem comes is that the restoration came about in a time period where there was already a tradition of a great apostasy. And so I think some Latter-day Saints, inher having inherited that tradition of a great apostasy, uh, which itself is born out of a tradition of the idea of a, of a, a period of dark ages, um, then used that inherited narrative to read our scriptures. And so I, I think the answer is to simply pay closer attention to what our scriptures actually teach. Uh, for instance, to go back to the example of Nephi's vision. Nephi sees a great and abominable church. And if we read over that too quickly, we say, oh, great and abominable church, that must mean great apostasy. That must mean there's no saints left. But if you read that, the first verse where this great and abominable church is introduced very carefully, what is the great and abominable church doing? It's killing the saints. And so it's not the saints themselves that are this great and abominable church. This, this church, this entity, whatever it is in this apocalyptic vision that, that is highly symbolic, is, is actively persecuting the church of God, the saints. Uh, so I, I think the answer is, uh, one, that we need, to, we need to be a little more charitable when we look at our ancient Christian ancestors. And, and not immediately assume it's all error, but look for the good. And two, I think we need to spend a little more time with our own scriptures, read them a little more carefully. I hope that, hope that answers your question. Thank you for your questions. Um, we'll now invite Miranda Wilcox up, um, and she will have the last word today. last word. <laughs> I'm just offering concluding remarks for today's conversation, but to the student who just asked a question, um, I, the reason why I was asked to give these closing remarks was because I co-edited a book called Standing Apart, um, Mormon Historical Consciousness and the Concept of Apostasy, and we specifically talked about the tradition of Latter-day Saints telling great apostasy narratives and talked about the origins and why it became embedded in our historical consciousness um, in, our, in our community. So this book was published nine years ago in 2014. And, um, and in this book, um, we encourage Latter-day Saints to expand um, the scope of their commitment to the dead, of our scope of our commitment to the dead and as Jason reminded us in his introduction, Latter-day Saints believe that turning our hearts to our ancestors with love is a sacred responsibility. Joseph Smith taught that one of the main purposes of the restoration of the priesthood, the power of Christ manifest on earth, was to realize or is to realize Malachi's prophecy that in the last days, Elijah would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. Joseph Smith revealed an, expansion, an expansive vision of this project of restoration in a letter he wrote to the saints in 1842. He prophesied, the earth will be stricken <coughs> with a curse unless there's a welding link of some kind or other between the fathers and the children. Performing sacred ordinances for the dead in, in temples would become a method of forging links between generations. But Joseph taught that vicarious temple work was just the beginning of a new era of communication between um, heaven and earth. For it is necessary in the ushering in of the dispensation of the fullness of times, which dispensation is now beginning to usher in, that a whole and complete and perfect union and welding together of dispensations and keys and powers and glory shall take place and be revealed from the days of Adam even to the present time. And not only this, but those things which never have been revealed from the foundation of the world. 
but the 15 contributors to Standing Apart posited that Latter-day Saints could and should create connections among the generations through historical narratives we tell, thus welding our representations of their memory and legacies we love. Standing Apart raised questions about Latter-day Saint attitudes um, regarding Christians before 1830 and whether ancient Christians have a legitimate claim to our attention. <coughs> we built on the work of Judith Liu, who's a scholar of um, late antiquity. She, uh, in, in her discussion of the emergence of early Christian identity in the Jewish and Greco-Roman worlds, she reminds us, quote, that the sense of self and that of other are constructed in mutual interaction, end quote, and that, quote, there can be other relationships with difference and alterity than the oppositional, unquote. Um, so Standing Apart offered an invitation um, to anyone reading uh, to consider the integrity and value of the experience of the dead with greater inclusivity and generosity, both to the past and to those of other religious traditions. The contributors of ancient Christians responded to this invitation with, generous, with a generous and theological ethic, an ethic grounded in the belief that respecting the integrity of the dead requires viewing them not in terms of oneself, but in terms of themselves. The authors engage in genuine conversation with ancient Christians. They invite readers to recognize mutual, mutuality with early Christians, and that these resonance stem from our shared faith in Jesus Christ. Yet, they also recognize differences with ancient Christians, <coughs> which provokes our awareness of their alterity, which awareness leads us to probe ways that our preconceptions and assumptions about them have distorted the integrity of their experience in our representations of them. This process of discerning um, similarity and difference leads uh, authors um, participating in ancient Christians, and I hope all those reading it and, and engaging with the book as well, into a dialectical relationship with ancient Christians um, in which we sincerely seek enrichment and insight from their experience. And this is an effort. Um, it is a, a labor of love. And such, such labor of love has precedent in scripture. After reflecting about Moroni's compilation of documents from over 400 years in his last additions to the Nephite scriptural record, David Holland concludes, quote, when different dispensations converge in the fullness of time, the shearing tensions can winnow the gospel seed from cultural shafts. Neither modern nor ancient husks should survive the threshing, and no eternal truth should be lost. As the breaking light reflects on ancient truths, the restoration unfolds. No one dispensation can be made perfect without, check, without the check and balance of the others. Moroni knows the that different eras have something sacred to say to each other." Unquote. So I'd like to end today's conversation with a quotation from the church newsroom's report celebrating the dedication of the church history library in 2009. The Mormon worldview compels a historical consciousness. Upon joining the church, each member becomes a participant in the grand unfolding of God's redemptive plan. The Mormon historical consciousness compels one to step outside the comfortable confines of the present, develop empathy to understand the past, the past, and in turn, lay the spiritual groundwork for future generations. A collective memory preserves the shared experiences and common language of meaning that binds a people together. To preserve history is to shape identity. And I think that ancient Christians, this volume, the work of labor, of these scholars um, on behalf of our community helps our faith community realize our responsibility to cultivate a redemptive historical consciousness. Um, so let us thank the authors for expanding our hearts and horizons towards our spiritual ancestors, the ancient Christian mothers and fathers.